All right. Why is that a close-up? No. <laughs> so, for the record, uh, where were you born and raised, and what did your parents do? Born in Brooklyn. Yeah. Brownsville, Brooklyn. Yes. Uh, Ninety odd years ago. Yes. And I was raised by my parents, you know. Yes. And. Uh, and what, what did they do? Were they from this country? or what? No, no, no. They met here, though, yes. but they came from a foreign country. Yes. My father came from Poland, and my mother came from Russia. Yes. And they met here, and they had the four boys here. And uh, now I know you got your start at a very young age. I've heard nine. Nine, yes. How did that come about, even? It was very simple. Uh, the Jewish theater was there. By, we lived around the corner yes. of the Yiddish theater there. And uh, it was called the Hopkinson Theater. Okay. And they had in the end, in the Forbes, that was their Jewish paper at that time. And my parents had it every day there. That, and it said uh, they want a young boy that knows this song, they'll promise me yes. a soprano. And, and uh, they love to hear him. And they, they explained what the scene was about. So my father said, we're going. <laughs> so we went. And they had about 14, 15 children there. And I was picked. Now, at that time, did you... So the song was in English, though, right? That's right, but yeah. did you speak Yiddish or the family? Oh, certainly. I spoke Yiddish, all right. That's all he spoke in the house. Really? Okay. It was Yiddish, you know, in those days. So from that first uh, experience with the theater, did you immediately know that that's what you wanted to do with your life, or did you... They, uh, no, they, like, adapted me, because yeah. uh, every, nearly every show had a young child in it, and if you spoke Yiddish, they, that's what they wanted, you know. And, and we had about four or five uh, boys like that. I wasn't alone, you know. And also, uh, every show had a wedding into it, you know. And uh, while the wedding is going on, the spotlight hits the box seat. And there's a kid of nine years old with a Buster Brown haircut. <laughs> period. Yes. And. Uh, Stop the show. Uh, a bet. dollar a night. Not bad, right? This Not is during the depression. Days. Yeah, I was the, I was the king of my house. Wow. Brought into the house eight, nine dollars a week. Terrific. Yeah. Now you, you hear about child actors and sometimes it's a situation where the kid wasn't so into doing it, but you seem like you really liked doing it. Well, is my that father liked it too? He did. <laughs> he wanted me to be an actor. Did you want to do it at that point of your life though? Oh sure. You did. For me it was fun. Yeah. Uh, my father always said I want him to be an actor yeah. so I can see shows for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I, I understand that the only, <laughs> the only time you took a hiatus from acting after that was when your My, voice cracked, right? That's right. Well, <laughs> your voice changes. So, uh, so what I was happened? I told by my father and mother, you'll have to learn a trade. Yeah. Uh, they didn't want me to go into their trade. Yeah. Uh, he had a straight hospital whereby during the war you couldn't get for your shirt the broadcloth, the army confiscated it for parachutes and so forth. So people fixed their shirts. A collar rubbed out, they turned it over, the cuffs, collar, the shirt, uh, and uh, he became very successful. And uh, what happened was, People used to ask him, what do you do for a living? He says, I'm a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> so come over to me, you should be proud of your father. Yeah. I said, I'm always proud of him. Yeah, yeah. He's a doctor. I said, sure, he has his own hospital. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a straight hospital. A straight hospital, and that's what. So you were you went to for vocational school for as a as a furrier. I went yeah as a furrier for three years. Yeah, and I worked out of the half hour. <laughs> when I went to do it, they, they sent me to a Bing house, yeah. which was a cousin of the family. Yeah. And as soon as I walked in, he expected me. My father yeah. recommended me, and he expected me, and he said, "You'll be a nailer." I said, "Oh no." <laughs> The nailer is the lowest part of right. the uh, trade, you know. Right. I'm an operator. Right. I showed him. I took out the, uh, the diploma with, yeah. the, with the honor pages and everything. He said, all right, make me a muff. Yeah. And this is a mink house. Yeah. And I made him a muff. In those days, the women wore the muffs. Very nice. He looks at it. When I finished, opens the door, threw me out bodily, <laughs> and called my father, thousands of furriers in the world, and you brought five-ish to me. <laughs> he ruined me $400, <laughs> which was true, it might have been that much. Wow. 
So my father told him to go to hell. Yeah, right. And in Yiddish, it was much stronger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, they haven't spoken to each other ever right, right, after right. that. He wouldn't talk to him. So when they had a banquet. It yeah. took a year till they found their seats. You won't sit there. <laughs> sit over there. Oh. So that was your excursion out of theater. You knew you. You then knew you wanted to come yeah. back. And so what happened was, I got word that in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. they're looking for a young man, uh, whereby uh, a song and dance man, but a young fellow. Yeah. And it was on a cooperative plan. Yeah. You know that means that they take off all the expenses mm -hmm. of us. The profit left over, they divide. Yep. At the beginning, it wasn't good. Yeah. Uh, they didn't send me money from home. I couldn't have stayed there. Yeah. But then it developed. It kind of. Then it developed. <laughs> and uh, I was there for 38 weeks. Yeah. And uh, really, that was a good education for me. Every week was a different show. Yeah. A different musical. And lucky that I knew from repertoire a lot of uh, Jacob Gordon plays which was very popular then. <clears throat> and above all, the musicals, I used to see them on second day. I, mean, so yes. I, I knew more or less what it was. But every week you had to memorize. So <clears throat> this this was Pittsburgh, but then after, after Pittsburgh, you came back here, and you were now Mr. Second Avenue, right? No, not no? yet. Not no. yet? Oh, what? no, that's, that's a different story. Okay, okay. Then the, the, I, the union wouldn't allow me to play New York. The Hebrew Actors Union. Really? No, no. Why were. was that? Well, that was their rule. You know, I wasn't a member of the union. So, you, but you could do Pittsburgh. You just couldn't come to New York. No, but uh, you could only take a job that nobody wanted. Okay. But then I went to Cleveland after that again, thirty-eight weeks. Uh huh. That I that they allowed me to play. Going to New York, they had a vaudeville house called the Clinton Theater. Uh -huh. I was home then. And uh, they were looking for a master of ceremonies that the uh, union said, okay, if you could find somebody, you could use them. And uh, I, I went down there, and the owner of the theater, the one, the producer, knew me when I was a kid. Yep. And he said, okay, we'll take a chance on yep. you. Uh, so he said, you'll do it this weekend. Yeah. And boy, I was the biggest flop he ever had. <laughs> My father tried to laugh in order to, <laughs> to get people the audience to laugh. My brother sat on the other side. Right. It was pathetic. Uh. <laughs> well, I had nothing then. I mean, <clears throat> it was a different story. Mm -hmm. But later, you got it. Five years later, I went back there. Okay, and and you at that point were now to New Yorkers. Were, would you have been a known quantity, or you had to now establish yourself in New no, York? No, I was a known property, a hot yeah. one too. Yes, yes. Oh, I was hot. Well, let's before we even delve into the to that. I want to ask you because there are very few people today who can answer this. You know, uh, the idea of a Yiddish uh, theater circuit—it's a foreign con. It does. It's been gone for so long, and so I wonder if you can just explain what was it, who attended it, and what made it special. The made it special. It was family entertainment. Mm -hmm. Number one. Yeah. Number two. It was enjoyable. As a matter of fact. A lot of people from uh, composers like Cole Porter and the Gershwins, all, all these big composers came downtown. They called it slumming. <laughs> the Yiddish Theater. Yeah. And they used to see our shows. Yeah. And they loved it, really. Yeah. And Cole Porter, if you read his biography, right. admits yeah. that a lot of the music that he wrote was in a minor key that he adapted from the Yiddish Theater. Wow. And were you primarily, well, let me ask before we get again specifically about you, was it primarily musicals or was it all kind of drama? We uh, played everything. You had to know everything. Yeah. Even dancing. And how big was it? Was there Were there tons of theaters? Where it were was they? It a big industry yeah. then when I, was, in the, in the, when I entered it. Mm -hmm. You had uh, three, three Yiddish theaters in Brooklyn alone. Mm -hmm. You had one, uh, three in the Bronx mm -hmm. was six. Mm -hmm. Second Avenue had four, was ten. Wow. Ten theaters. Wow. Then don't forget Cleveland had a theater, yep. Chicago had a theater, and California had a theater. And and what about Canada? Yeah. Canada, Toronto had one, and Montreal had two. And these all these were always oh, working yeah. year round and full houses and things like that. Forty weeks was a season. Yeah. They went by season. Yeah. 
And we were lucky in one thing. Let's say you did a show that died. Yeah. The critics didn't like it. It's not doing business. Next week, there was a different yeah. show there. It's not the same as Broadway in no, that Broadway, sense. No, Broadway, the scenery goes into a bond. They burn the scenery and they finish. <laughs> uh, right. But not with us, you yeah. know. With us, next week, even the composer sat down and wrote new stuff. So you had to be nimble and learn quickly, right? Oh, that was, yeah. yeah. Well, we had that... Uh, we were lucky that we had that kind of talent yeah. to memorize. And, and it was... We had prompters too, don't forget. Did you really? Sure. So I how used did... to say to prompter, who says that line? <laughs> At rehearsal, he says, first, he says, I say it. Yeah. He says, then you say it. Yeah. Then I repeat it, and then the audience hears it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so... Was it primarily young people like yourself, or was it all ages? Or oh, all ages yeah. at that time, and a lot have escaped. Yeah, uh, the, the sort of trouble in Europe that yeah. was going on in the thirties. Uh, a lot of them have escaped, mm -hmm. really escaped. They came here, they looked terrible, mm -hmm. drag it down, you know, mm -hmm. something that you would say to Catrick, that yeah. they, they were lucky to get here, you know. Yeah. And uh, then they developed, uh, they started to marry uh, American boys and yeah. girls, whatever. And it, yeah, assimilated. And, and uh, that's what happened. Yeah. Um, so who were the biggest names in Yiddish theater? When I started, yeah. we had a lot of... Ludwig Zatz yeah. was a name, one of the greatest actors that I've ever seen. Okay. And Schwartz was even then in the Yiddish art theater. That Schwartz, you said? Marie Schwartz. Marie Schwartz, okay. Yes. He was a young fellow then, but he had that ambition. Yeah. And it worked for him. Yeah. And he played all the literate type of shows. We did the... Uh, for the popular demand, and yet, in the middle of the week, an organization wanted a certain play, we gave it to them. Wow. We knew it, but you we did, gave it yeah. to them. And to change scenery is not like Broadway. Yeah. One, two, three, and the scene was up. Yeah. You know. Uh, Amazing. Now, did uh, was it the kind of thing like at stock, you hear about stock companies that... No, it was more than that. Yeah. It was more. A stock company is a company that does very quick work. It's yeah. half baked, uh, yeah. actually. Yeah. And it, it takes time to break in a play. Yeah. Uh, with us, it wasn't a stock company. It was the real, the real thing. But I mean, in the sense of, were you guys also making the scenery and doing other we things? We never did that. Yeah, you had other had people. Unions, strong unions. Oh, okay. You, we, you couldn't touch a table. Yeah. They would come over. You can't <laughs> do that. That's our job. We, we moved the table. Right. A chair, a table, I mean, whatever, you can't do that. And uh, strong unions, yeah. in fact, we had a chorus union, too. Really? Sure, they, even in their late 50s, wow. they did college boys and girls. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they were really fun, but they died out, Yeah. and they don't have that anymore. No, and I, I want to ask you that, but I, about that, but I also first have to ask, did anyone ever make the jump? from Yiddish theater, uh, aside from you, to more mainstream entertainment? Oh, certainly. Certainly that we know of uh, Paul Muni. Had Paul Muni, he didn't get along. I didn't blame him yeah. when I read his biography. Mm -hmm. And uh, his name was Muni Weisenfrau. <laughs> he changed it in Hollywood. Wow. With him was quite a thing. Uh, what was it? Jed Harris yeah. was a big producer mm -hmm. and told him, he saw him play a part, Hard to Be a Jew is the name of the show. Hard to Be a Jew? Yeah. yeah. It was written by Shalom Aleichem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereby he's a student, a Russian student, and his friend was a Jewish student. So they switched. They wanted to show him what suffering we did yeah. in Europe in those days. Yeah. And he was brilliant. Mm. And Jed Harris came to see it. He said, what are you doing here? You belong uptown. Mm -hmm. In case you don't get along or you quit or if you're free, call me. And uh, he didn't get along yeah. because the critics came out with Paul Muni. Muni wise in front of Marie Schwartz says, wait a minute, this is my theater. Uh, We're going to switch parts. And so he, they switched parts. They booted him out. And little did he realize that Muni with a beard yeah. was first class. Yeah. He huh. was in his 20s then. And he went on to great... Things. What are you talking? Yeah. The critics liked him better than this world of the Yeah. Year. And then he, they had a uh, fight, a battle, and he quit. And he went to Jet Harris. He promised him, and he delivered. Amazing. And then you had, uh, uh, besides that, you had uh, a lot of them. 
Lolly Pekin, uh -huh. made the uh, crossover, uh -huh. Herschel Benardi, uh -huh. David Apatashu, uh -huh. myself, thank God. Yes, yes. And uh, about four more that I can't remember. Sure, sure, moment, sure. That have uh, crossed over. Now, uh, I know that you were not solely a musical person, but musical were, was a, a big part of your repertoire. You were you were a very talented singer, right? And songwriter. Yeah, well, I, I always call myself a songwriter, but I wrote my own, I wrote my own songs yep. that I did. And Can I ask you about one that I've heard about? I, I, I heard you did a, uh, uh, a great, no matter what happens, if uh, I've got to eat. Yeah, quite a dampenessen, quite a dampenessen. What's this old spate as I'm getting finished? The cup of wine, quite a dampenessen. It's a fish, a fleece, a soup. Business for you, this might be a quite a mess. Very good. It was a hit, uh, you'll be surprised. And can you for, they, they for... all uh, yelled up, Essen, Essen. <laughs> when I went to Broadway to do the, I prepared, but it didn't matter. They wanted to hear that. That's great, that's great. And there was another song. Yeah. I did over 65 years ago called I'm a Border by My Wife. When I Border by My Wife. <laughs> and uh, then when we, they had a, uh, a documentary yeah. honoring Itzhak Perlman, the yeah. great violinist. And I did a scene in that documentary of a Yiddish studio, a radio studio. They asked me to do that song. Yeah. So I told them, not only will I do that song, I was that honored. I would do it the same way I did it 60 odd years wow, ago wow. with the same dance. Wow. And my other son, I had wrote a new arrangement. Wow. And so everywhere we went, he prepared the music. Elliot yes. is a pianist. Yes. He, everywhere we went, he prepared the music. That's amazing. No matter what I wanted to do, they used to yell up, Sing them border. <laughs> That's terrific. Sing them border. And, uh, uh, can you talk about Yiddish radio? It was oh, also it was big, right? Very big. WEVD, WBNX, and were you were you LTG? Were you very involved with that as well? Oh, certainly. Wow. So there was a lot of crossover. If you were, uh, oh, I, I used to make thanks. extra money going on the Yiddish uh, radio. Terrific. You know, Terrific. Uh, those days they paid ten bucks a program. So let me ask you this: the uh, the Jewish population in America has not since that time particularly fluctuated that much, but the Yiddish theater and radio and things like that have sort of faded away. Why do you, what What do you believe was at the root of it going away? Was it the television? It's very or? simple. No, yeah. no. Neighborhood. The neighborhood changed. Uh -huh. So a lot of them retired, uh -huh. figured let's go to Miami or different neighborhoods they went, and uh -huh. that was our customers. Yes. So and we had to go there. So you went, you saw, you sort of saw the writing on the wall, right? And you were oh, I branched saw. out. And I tried to branch out. Yeah. At the beginning, I couldn't. I auditioned for Cole Porter and A. Burroughs for the show Can Can. Uh -huh. I didn't make it. Since then, I told him I'm not going to audition anymore. <laughs> I'm very comfortable here. Yeah, yeah. But from 48 weeks became 25. Yeah. And the last show I did was 14 weeks. I figured I got to get out. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't easy getting out either. So in order to make a living, uh, I did bar mitzvahs and weddings I performed. Mm -hmm. Of course, in those days, they hired a comedian mm -hmm, at mm -hmm. these affairs. Yeah. You know. Today, they hire a disc jockey with You're all right. With all the uh, with records that he does, you know, and the, he does the announcing and so. But in those days, my God, they hired a comedian. Wow. I used to, I used to tell them, I used to tell them, in case he lays an egg, he can kill your affair. That's right. That's right. So don't blame him for that. Yeah. I want you know right away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, I, you know, what some people uh, I know did uh, during that time, I believe, was. I, the Borscht Belt or Catskills or things like Catskills that. Catskills was a big income for me. How, what only. exactly was? Cause that's another thing that's that's kind of gone. It, what, I don't. People like gone. my generation don't know about it. They don't. We yeah. used to have the Catskills, four hundred hotels. Wow. I had a contract for fifty every summer. Wow. And I didn't even scratch the surface. So what would you do there? You would you would do a. I did a my stick? act. Yeah. I had an act, a family <laughs> comedy act that was very successful. And uh, I did that, you know, 
Elliot here, the one sitting here, yes. I think was about 10 or 12, he was by a company. Nice. <laughs> and was it, the, the, the clientele there were, were primarily... From the theater. From the people. theater. They all went there. But also... Jews looking summer. to get away in the summer, pretty much? What? Get, it was Jewish people looking to get away from the heat? That's right, they yeah. got away. To, don't forget, in those days, yeah. you had a lot of tenement houses. Yeah. You know, not like today, you have the condominium. Yeah, yeah. And they needed the air. Yeah. And the air out there was excellent. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them had tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. There were two hospitals there for that. Mm -hmm. For the TB, they called it the TB houses. And... Uh, it really helped. You'll be surprised. The air was so wonderful out there. It still is. And did you enjoy working there? Certainly, I enjoyed. Yeah. It was a big income for me. Yeah. The and end of the summer, you had a you had a deposit to put away. You yeah. know. Absolutely. Um, and it was also a big break in for comedians. Yeah. A lot of them started there, and, and not everybody became big, you yeah. know. But they started there and had where to get. They had where to start today. They don't know what they do. I have a, this is a little, a bit of an aside, but I have to ask you, because I just recently interviewed a woman in, in L.A. who was 100 years old and said she worked there as well, so I wonder if you knew her. Connie Sawyer? Did you know Connie, Connie Sawyer, her name was? Certainly. Yeah? I know Connie yeah, Sawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she was, did a fiddler too, didn't she? I think so. She did the, uh, she did, I'll tell you, uh, in the dream scene. She did the witch. Is that the right? <laughs> That's an amazing memory. Yeah. Wow. I, I, well, my memory, thank God. Terrific. It serves me. Well, so now the, that was sort of a transitionary period, the Catskills and all of that, because <laughs> post Yiddish theater, pre what you would go on to do. So I know that Broadway always held a great appeal for you, and it was It was hard to get in there. And I know you were very disappointed with the Cole Porter thing when oh, that. Oh, that was terrible. Yeah. It was something I never had. What, how I got to the audition, yeah. they had a, an agency, and the agent's father was, he was, I, he was a fan of mine, and he told me, you got to get five-ish a Broadway show. <laughs> he said to him, and I want you to do it now. <laughs> they were casting cake. And, right. So they got me, a, in fact, I even got a call back on wow. that. Wow. Uh, in those days, every character man sang the sunny side of the street when he, when he went to do an audition. I did it the first time. How does that go again? Can I ask grab you? Grab your coat and grab your hat. Leave your worries on the doorstep. Just direct your feet on the sunny side of the street. Terrific. And, but I figured I'd better change it. Maybe it'd be more interesting. Yeah. So I came the second time. Louis Prima did that song. So, so I, I repeated it. Uh, it was uh, based on Figaro, but it was based on a fat woman. The bigger the figure, the better I like it. The better I like it. The bigger the figure, the better I like it. They loved it. They and uh, they told me uh, politely, Cole Porter told me politely, I, I see you very often. You're a fine artist, Mr. Finkel. So you figure, well, now, let's get to it. Yeah. We have no part for you in this play. I was so devastated. I said, I'm not going to audition anymore. That's it. Time passes by, and they're doing Fiddler on the Roof. And uh, the office called me, the Robbins office, if I want to uh, go with the national company. I said, well, uh, that was a chance to get out. Yeah. And, uh, as, you know, it wasn't easy auditioning for this one or that one. Till I came to him was the third time, mm. you know. The, and uh, thank God I was accepted. I did the innkeeper, then later on the butcher, and I did Tavia for quite a while yeah. too, you know. So collectively with Fiddler, it was a this twelve-year run, which is amazing. It was amazing. I never leave a hit. Yeah, <laughs> and that and that was a hit. Uh, look, even today, yeah. read the script, read the score. You know that it was one of the greatest shows of our generation Absolutely. was Fiddler on the Roof. And uh, I always said on every interview, Tevye is a character man's Hamlet. Mm -hmm. Like a young man wants to do Hamlet. Yep. Every character actor wants to do Tevye. Yeah, wow. It's a fact, and it's true. Now, uh, you did very long runs, not just with that, but also with Little Shop of Horrors. That's right. I was not the original. No. I was the, I was the standby for... I could have been the original, but I didn't take it at the beginning. 
Uh, Why was that? Did you just because I, I signed a contract. Mm -hmm. I was doing the road company of Fiddler in 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, they revived it. Mm -hmm. And I signed the contract. Mm -hmm. So the, the one that produced it, the WPA Theater, yeah. they called it, he called me. He says, I know that we can't pay you like they pay you with Fiddler, but we're doing a show called Little Shop for mm -hmm. Horrors and there's the flower dealer and we'd love to have you come down if you... I said, well, I'd love to, but I can't. Yep. Um, I signed a contract with the Fiddler Show. Mm -hmm. And so I stayed through the revival lasted about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Then I come home. They did it in the WPA Theater, yep. it was a big hit. So they moved to the Orpheum Theater mm -hmm. on 2nd Avenue and they needed a standby for, uh, for the uh, a lot of our uh, character men audition. Yeah. I auditioned, thank God I got it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what happened. Amazing. The other guy quit. The other guy quit. And he was wonderful, wonderful actor. Do you remember who that was? Sure, I remember. He was a friend of mine. His name was High Anzel. Uh -huh. His father owned a restaurant, Moskowitz and Lupowitz. <laughs> uh, that was his father's place. Wow. And. Uh, his mother, when we were in a hotel for the summer, his mother came as a guest. So she said, I have three sons, two are fine. They help out their father, the rest of She said, one is on sugar and he wants to be a doctor. <laughs> and he turned out to be a very good yes. actor. He was very good at it, but he quit. So the thing with doing these plays that, that go on forever, like, like Fiddler, like Little Shop Horrors, uh, as a non-actor, I am wondering, to me, it seems like it would maybe grow a little repetitive, you would get tired of it, but yet actors say they love it because they're, they they discover new things. And So what was your experience? Did you did you ever tire of these long runs, or you really like I never like, got tired. Yeah. I never got tired because you have to learn sometimes at bad times, too. And uh, in the Yiddish theater, we had bad times, uh -huh. no doubt about it. Uh -huh. The, the uh, seasons became smaller. When you have a family to support, and, uh, you're overhead and this and that. So you think of doing extra things, you know. So with me, I kept thinking uh, of the bad times, uh -huh. and I enjoyed it. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I never... Steady watched. work. It was steady work yeah. and uh, renowned work, you yeah. know. You were covered by fine critics uh -huh. when you did those kind of things, and first-class directors uh -huh. and fine composers uh, yeah. that they had, you know, so... Well, I have heard you say that you feel that your career was sort of taken to another level when you got a phone call from David E. Kelly. Yes. What, what was that about? Was, yes. I did a picture from Little Shop of Horrors came a lot of commercials mm -hmm. and movies. I did a picture for a Cindy Lumet called Q&A. Mm -hmm. I had about 10 minutes in it. Yeah. I, I complained to him. He says, don't complain. You'll never know what this picture will do for you. Yeah. And he was right. They were looking for Wambo character, the character Douglas Wambo, and he wasn't Jewish. <laughs> and he, they were not happy what the casting people showed him. So he did his friends, he brought them into his house for dinner, uh -huh. and he hired the movie Q&A. As soon as I went on, they started laughing. He said, there he is. <laughs> and it was a miracle. He yeah. called 20th Century Fox in New York. Uh -huh. They knew who he was talking about. Uh -huh. They called my agent in one hour. One hour, wow. One hour, the deal was made to do the pilot. Wow. And that was, that was a, obviously a That's tremendous... That's a miracle. That is a miracle. You that never hear that. That is a miracle. And then from there on, he made it a Jewish character, David. And you and you made it something very special. And I got you, an Emmy for you that. You got your Emmy. And the episode that you got it for was very, very memorable. The episode I did that I got it for, I told a joke in the synagogue and a rabbi threw me out. <laughs> That's right. And then you took him to, to court, right? I had a big court there. Right. And uh, uh, the, he had to take me back, you yes, know. Yes, yes. And... Uh, there was who got me back, the children of the sheriff. Yes. They went to my defense. Yes. And they said, We're Gentiles. We'd love to have Mr. Wombo join our yes. church and things like that. <laughs> and, they, and then they 
they allowed me to go back, you know. Right. He couldn't have gotten rid of me, the rabbi, because right. even a murderer, once that door is open, whether it's a church or a synagogue, uh -huh. a sanctuary. Uh -huh. And uh, But however, I had that scene, uh, the dramatic scene. Yeah. And the very last scene when I thanked the sheriff for his children, that did it. Yeah. Now, that was the one. The, the previous year you'd been nominated for the Emmy. Yeah, I didn't get it. You didn't get it? No. But then you go back a year later thinking, oh, I'm not, I didn't get it last year, I'm not going to get yeah, it. Yeah, I, I didn't even prepare a speech. <laughs> and yet you gave a very memorable one. Well, yeah, oh my God, they all remember it. The very first year I prepared a speech, every critic said I'm going to get it. Yes. You want to see the speech? <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, at any rate, I didn't get it. But the, I told my wife should rest in peace. We're going in to enjoy the show. And, yeah. and that's it. I had nothing prepared. And I, 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 they mentioned my name. I got so crazy. You know, <laughs> I danced going up to the stage. And uh, they make an announcement before these ceremonies. Yeah. You only have 30 seconds. If you talk more, the band will play loud and the mic will go down. Yeah. So I went up. I said... Did you hear that announcement? I don't care what they tell me. I waited 50 years to get on this stage, and I'll talk as much as I want. They started laughing, and teleprompter said, keep going, you're getting laughs. That's great. That's I, great. Did, I did more than 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> and so David E. Kelly, to his credit, was smart enough to come back to you after Picket Fences when he now had Boston, Boston Public. Public. Yeah. And when they want you, my dear friend, they'll find you in Johannesburg. Yeah. <laughs> when they want you, right. they don't want you. You can walk their dog, take them to lunch, and tell them how great they are. You can forget it. We were in Miami. I was uh, performing right. for the condominiums with my sons, yeah. and all of a sudden, the agent gives me a call. David Kelly called. He wants to talk to you. Is it okay? I said, certainly. What do you mean, okay? <laughs> and he talked to me about Boston Public. Yeah. I said, he says, do you want to see a script? It's a history teacher. I said, who wrote it? He said, I did. I don't have to see anything, yeah. I told him. And I said, okay. Terrific. And I called back the agent. I think we're back in business. Yeah, that's awesome. Four years. The, uh, the third of the three sort of primary... Uh, outlets for actors is obviously movies, and I and you have had uh, a pretty. Uh, you've been a part of a lot of great ones, whether it's Nixon or Q and A or A Serious Man, and we could go on and on, and with great directors. Nixon was a, 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 quite an experience. Please tell uh, yeah. Stone. What's his name? Oliver uh, Stone. Yeah. Uh, Oliver Stone. Yeah. Oliver Stone. Yeah. yeah. I don't audition. I told the casting people. And they told him, but he, he sent for me anyway. Nice. You go into his office, all the big stars are there. <laughs> they, 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 they read. I, yeah. But I figured I'm not a, that good of a reader. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell him I don't audition. You know, yeah. I put on the yeah, act. Yeah, yeah. He calls me in. He says, uh, you want to appear with Mr. Hopkins? He's doing Nixon. It was a Jewish, he had a Jewish campaign manager. Mm -hmm. I said, certainly. He said, okay, here's the script, here's that. I, then I figured, well, I, should I read for him? He's such a nice man. So I said, would you want me to read? He says, if you read, you're not going to get it. Get out. <laughs> he threw me out of the office. That's great. He threw me out of the agent said, I got the contract. Everything went so quick, you know. That is terrific. And I did it. And I, I, I was just disappointed. He, mm -hmm. He's such a fine gentleman. Mm -hmm. Usually his plays, his, his uh, films. Yeah. A lot of violence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I figured he was a violent man. <laughs> but really, he wasn't. That is so funny. I, so at the end of the picture, when I finished my role, he says, what did you think of me? He says to me, yeah. I said, Mr. Stone, I'm disappointed. <laughs> I expected a violent man, and here you go. I said, here you go, and you're so nice, and you're a gentleman, you know. That, and we parted very good friends. That is so very fun. Very good friends. Well, we uh, we have to also talk about For Love and Money, right? Huh? For Love and Money. For Love and Money, they wrote the part for me. They wrote the part That's for pretty me. That's a pretty big bellhop. compliment. A funny bellhop there. Yes. You were they wrote it for me. Terrific, yes. Yeah. And you enjoyed that. Oh, I, yeah. I enjoyed my work very yes. much, really. Yes. I really do. 
Well, the, the, the most recent uh, major movie that I want to ask you about, because we talked a little bit earlier, I think it's one of the greats. It will be, its reputation will only grow with time, is A Serious Man with the Coen brothers. And well, that's a, that, was, that movie had a different history of, uh, about uh, a few months before they started doing the movie. A friend of mine, an actor, came over to me and he said, I, I have to audition a role, that's all in Yiddish. I said, come over, I'll help you out. And I helped him out. Mm -hmm. And I got him a letter perfect. A week I called him later, he didn't get it. Mm -hmm. Then another friend called. And uh, the same thing. <laughs> I worked with him and taught him everything. And they were good, they're wonderful actors. Yeah. And two weeks later, I said, no, did you get it? He said, no, I didn't get it. So I was wondering, what's happening here? <laughs> I can't believe it. Why don't they send for me, you yeah. know? Sure enough, they did. Nice. And well, that was that. We would like to see Mr. Finkel. <laughs> and uh, I came down, yeah. and they got the Academy Award for a, for a picture preceding this. The, oh, yes, No Country it. for Old Men. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I figured, I'm going to break my rule for them, I will read. Yes. And sure enough, they, you read it, they take it down on a little camera, they tape it, you see. Yeah. And the camera broke down. Oh. I said, when that does it, you know you're finished. Because it can never come out the same yeah. when you do it all over again. Yeah. And uh, they fixed it, okay, let's hear it again. So the, the uh, shorter brother, you, we'll have to, you'll do it again. But the, he said, do it the way you did it the first time. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I'd be delighted I did it. And two days later, I got the film. Terrific. And that, and that part is so interesting because the Dybbuk, we should note, first of all. It was interesting because it had to do, it was a lot of questioning about it. It had to do a lot, a lot with the, uh, why is it in the picture? And there was reasons for that. Yeah. We have so much trouble, our people, especially with the Holocaust. Yes. Yeah. We have, and a lot of our humor came out from the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had to have that humor to survive in order, in order to to really exist. Yeah, they had, they had that little sense of humor. How they did it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And yet, there was a reason. The man helped the guy out of the road with his wagon. Mm -hmm. He helped him out. So he invited him for some hot some soup, mm -hmm. and he comes in with the wife. It's trouble. She thinks that he's a dipper or he's a character because she found out that he died a few days. And he explains he didn't die. It was a mistake, yeah. you know. And finally, she kills him with an ice pick, you know, that, that shows that he leaves after that uh -huh. to show that his own. He came to help out there and they liked him and everything and she started trouble. Mm -hmm. And the man that plays the serious man, yes. he had the same malady yes. as the uh, guy she thought it was a Dybbuk. Yes. You know, maybe he was. Right. He never Nobody knows. knows. That was the mystery of this. And it's sort of like, you know, similar to the movie that you, you talked about, No Country for Old Men, the, the whole, the line that they explicitly say in that movie is, you can't stop what's coming. No. And in the, in a way, with that was the message of a serious man too. No matter what you do, it does it. You can be a great person, you can be a bad person, but it's sort of fate. Well, that's what it is. And don't forget that the picture, the, the one preceding the serious mm -hmm. man, he killed you according to when he flipped the coin. Mm -hmm. If it came out heads, he wouldn't kill you. Mm -hmm. Tails, he'd kill you. You know. It's interesting because the Coen brothers are obviously Jewish, but they're not really religious, and yet their movies have this sort of philosophical feel. They have, like uh, the one with uh, George Clooney. Yeah, Burn After yeah. Uh, Reading. Yeah, and uh, you know, they, they, they're they very talented, Yeah, and they did on order the uh, True Grit, mm -hmm. which was a revival, a very big hit, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what they go on, you yeah. know. Yeah, interesting. That's exactly it. Well, um, having worked in all of these different mediums for an actor, is there one that you prefer more, theater, TV, film? Is I like them all, yeah. really. People always ask me, yeah. uh, like, uh, which you prefer, the theater uh, screen or, you know, or TV. Mm -hmm. I prefer them all. Mm -hmm. I like them all. 
when you when you first get your break at 70, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> then you think different than when you get your break at 50. Mm -hmm. 50, you figure, oh, why am I holding back my creative, <laughs> my creative ability? Why am I doing this? Right. You know, uh, I never thought that way. Uh -huh. Neither did the, the one that did Matt Dillon. Yeah, right, 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 right. Oh, yeah, Gunsmoke, right. <laughs> he didn't think that way either. Right, right. And uh, a lot of people don't think that, you know. That what they do, that's what that's their life's yeah. work. But to me, what it, I enjoy films, I enjoy stage, I enjoy TV. I really do, and I even enjoy single appearances. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do a lot of that too, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank God, next month I'll be 91, yeah. and the phone is still ringing, thank God. So Sorry, I didn't miss anything. No, well, just as a, a last few quick things, I just want to... Yeah, quick, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, I, think, I find it very interesting that as you became more prominent in the business, you never ran away from your Jewish heritage. A lot of people, oh, no. No. many people change their name, they change their nose, they change <laughs> everything. You embraced it. I mean, I understand your actual, uh, your English name is Philip, but you always went with your Yiddish oh, name. I was just my Jewish name. Your Jewish name. And, but yet, that couldn't have made it easier for you. In, oh, in, no. Uh, so what, why do you think so many other people run away from it, and why did you run towards it? Because they have stupid agents. <laughs> their agents are stupid. They say, you have to change your name because of the marquee, blah, blah, blah. Today, they don't do that. Mm -hmm. Today, whoever heard a, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, a leading lady called Crabtree. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> other names right. that they have, right. CK this, that, yeah. Yeah, right. you know. <laughs> years ago, uh, I keep telling them, had it been many years ago, they would have wanted to change my name. Yeah. They, I never had that problem. Never did. Even when I signed to do Fiddler mm -hmm. for Harold Prince, didn't have that problem. Did you ever encounter anti-Semitism through the business? Many times. Really? Oh, sure. Many times. In what sorts of ways? Well, we had a few uh, in Fiddler. Yeah. A few people that worked at Fiddler that mm. even some uh, chorus people were a little anti-Semitic. Because they were jealous. They said, we're taking all their money and things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but however, in, in traveling, we, we hit a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Don't forget when we did Fiddle on the Roof, Beards was not that uh, you know popular as it is today. Mm -hmm. Today, a man with a beard, you don't even take a second look. Right. But in those days, you did. Mm -hmm. uh, we hit a lot. In fact, when we played Dallas, we were the stars of the uh, Dallas State Fair. Mm -hmm. And we all had to pile into a bus was two buses with bodyguards armed wow. to make sure nothing happens to us. Wow. And we couldn't go in the midway either. Wow. You did the show, you went to the bus and back in the hotel. You ate in the hotel, that went on for 10 days. Wow. I snuck away once, I went on the midway, and uh, after a half hour I hear a voice behind me. Well, did you have enough? I take a look, it's the bodyguard from one of the buses. Uh, <laughs> he followed me. Wow, wow. Figured let him just see and enjoy a little bit the midway, you yeah. know, and that's what happened. Wow. Oh, sure. But you. it's gotten better, right? Oh, much better yeah. now, but there's still it's still there. Memphis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or southern places right, sometimes. Right. Well, just. Uh, if I go there, go to Paris. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you'll find it. Yes. Or go to Austria and things like that. Yeah. Um, now, Yiddish itself, which you're always going to be associated with, is in some ways, I know you say not in all ways, but in some ways it's, a, it's an endangered language because not many people speak it in the way that your family did. Uh, well, not the way the family did, yeah. but they still speak it. They know, uh, they know what a lot of things mean. Is it important to keep it alive? Oh, well, certainly. They're, doing, they're keeping it alive anyway. Many colleges have that course, mm -hmm. and it's sold out. Yeah. I went to a college uh, to order a, a class there in, in California. The mobs in there, they had to take a big classroom to hold a couple of hundred uh, students. Wow. And they all laughed and enjoyed it. Do you have a uh, favorite Yiddish phrase? What? Do you have a favorite Yiddish yes, phrase? Yes, I got to you. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, on a, on a more serious note, just last question. Many years from now, when all of us are gone, what would you like people to 
remember about your amazing career and your life and, and your legacy? Well, that's a difficult question, you yeah. know that. What I, if they would say that I, I was a wonderful uh, actor would be nice, but more important, as a husband and a father, mm -hmm. that I would like them to say. Uh, those three things, yeah. uh, not necessarily in that order, yeah. <laughs> but those three things, you know. I tried to be a good father, and it paid off very well. Mm -hmm. My sons are good boys, very good, the family is good. Mm -hmm. And uh, I broke the record, I was married 61 years. Wow. And she passed on four years ago, and she's being missed. Mm -hmm. You know, you miss yeah. a person, it's a lifetime. Of course, in Hollywood, after 10 weeks, they, <laughs> they call it a night. Right. <laughs> they had enough. <laughs> right. Well, you, uh, you're terrific, and I really appreciate you doing this. It's wonderful, and thank you so much. Oh, and uh, but do me a favor. Yes. When it's printed or whatever, yes. send me a copy. Oh, of course. Of course. Absolutely. Well, thank you so thank much. You. Really thank you. Thank you, Scott. It. You're a wonderful interviewer, Thank you. Well, I have a great subject. No, Thank he you. is so you're wonderful, really Thank wonderful. You. I appreciate that. Thank you very much.